welcome! My name is Mini Betrayal, and this is a Factorio tutorial, Trains. I'll start off by mentioning that this video is quite long, but it's not necessarily meant to be viewed all at once, or even in order. Check the video description for chapter headings, and feel free to skip back and forward to learn about whichever part of the train system you'd like to, or you can watch the whole video in order to get a more coherent and complete experience. At the end of the video, I have a few worked examples with links to blueprints. Remember though that Factorio is still in early access, and so some features could change in the future. This video was made with Factorio 0.17, and if there are any major differences made in the future, I'll aim to either post a comment below or make a follow-up video explaining the differences. Starting off with the research, there are 12 different research items related to the train system in the vanilla version of the game. First is the Railway Research. The prerequisites are the Engine and Logistics 2 researches, which in turn require Steel Processing Logistics Science Pack and Logistics 1 researches. The research itself costs 75 of both Automation and Logistics Science Packs, and unlocks three items – the Rail, the Locomotive, and the Cargo Wagon. This research will allow you to build trains that you can drive around and have a bit of fun in, but to have any kind of automatic system, we need the next research. The next item of research is automated rail transportation, which requires the railway as a prerequisite, costs another 75 automation and logistic science packs, and unlocks the train stop. With this research under your belt, you'll be able to set up trains to go back and forth on their own, allowing you to deliver resources around while you take care of other things in your base. Next, Rail Signals. This research has automated rail transportation as its prerequisite, and costs 100 automation and logistic science packs. It unlocks two kinds of rail signal, the rail signal and the rail chain signal. They each have their uses, which I'll explain later in the video, but their use will allow you to schedule multiple trains on the same network without worrying about your trains crashing into each other. This way you don't need to build a separate loop of track for each train. The next research to look at is the Fluid Wagon. This one is a little more expensive, at 200 Automation and Logistic Science Packs, and it requires the Basic Railway and Fluid Handling as its prerequisites. As you might expect, it unlocks the Fluid Wagon, which allows you to transport fluids along your rail network, and that can be very useful for retrieving oil from far away oil deposits, or delivering sulfuric acid to a uranium mining outpost. I'll next point out the Artillery Research. Amongst other things, this unlocks the Artillery Wagon, which is a rail-based artillery gun. This is more expensive again, and is quite far down the tech tree. Interestingly, the rail technology itself is not actually a prerequisite, so it is possible to build an artillery wagon without having any rails to place it on. The last batch of researchers to look at is Breaking Force. There are seven tiers of research here, each having the previous tier as a prerequisite, and Breaking Force 1 having the Rail and Chemical Science Pack researchers as its prerequisites. Each tier increases in cost, with Tiers 1 and 2 costing 100 and 200 of each Automation, Logistic and Chemical Science Packs respectively, Tiers 3, 4 and 5 costing 250, 350 and 450 of each Automation, Logistic chemical and production science packs respectively, and tiers 6 and 7, costing 550 and 650 of each automation, logistic, chemical, production and utility science packs respectively. Each research increases the amount of braking force your trains have, meaning they don't need to brake for as long to come to a stop, thereby effectively decreasing the time taken to get from A to B. The tier 1 research increases the braking force by 10%, and the following tiers each increase the braking force by 15% increments. The bonuses are additive rather than multiplicative, meaning if you have tiers 1 and 2 researched, your total braking force will be 25% greater than normal. So there's a lot to break down here, let's start at the beginning. Rails take one stone, one steel plate, and one iron stick to make, and they are made two at a time. You'll need a lot of rails to get a train network going, so it's often a good idea to automate the production of rails if you want to have a network of any appreciable size. Rails are placed down by hand in one of four rotations, up-down, left-right, and your two diagonals. 
You can press R to rotate, as with most other in-game entities. You should also note that the rail is a 2x2 two two block if you compare it to another item like a chest, but it can only be placed on a special grid. This is good as it means you won't have an awkward off by one error when building a long stretch of track, but it does mean that you need to be careful about placing things like inserters to empty your trains. In general, it's a good idea to place rails down before placing anything else next to them. To lay a stretch of track, hold the rail in your hand and click. That will place down a single rail item. You can continue placing rails like this if you wish, but there's an easier way, and it's something you'll need to know when coming to corners or curves. With the rail in your hand, mouse over the end of a section of an already built rail. You'll see a little arrow indicating the direction you can build in. Click the mouse, and then move the mouse to where you'd like to build towards. You'll see a ghost section of track that will turn red if you can't build there. When you are happy with the new section, click again to place it. You can then continue to move your mouse and click to place rails until you're done, and then press Q to deselect the rail. If you want to build an offshoot from your main track, hold the rails in your hand just as before and mouse over the track. You can build out from the middle of a track, just like you can from the end. You may notice that sometimes you'll see the ghost rail turn blue. This just means that you already have a rail in that position and it won't cost you anything to place another there. Another thing worth mentioning is that curved sections of rail cost 4 rail items, as they are longer. Lastly, there is a ghost construction available for longer sections of track. As you mouse over the track you'd like to build from, press shift while you click to start building. This will show you another ghost rail, but this time the game will attempt to create a path to your mouse cursor no matter where it is. You can rotate the direction of the end of the rail with the R key to try and approach the destination from another direction, but if the game can't figure out a path, you'll be shown a red X. When you are happy, click and ghost rails will be placed so that you can build later on, or you can allow your robots to deal with it for you. Once again, you can press Q to exit the rail building mode. There are a number of different styles you can employ when constructing a rail network, some of which I'll go through a little later in the video. Now let's actually build some trains. A train in Factorio can be of any length, but you'll need at least one locomotive to get it moving. A locomotive costs 30 steel plates, 10 electronic circuits, and 20 engine units. You can only place train components on a rail, so you'll need to have a rail already built first. Don't forget that if you're going for the 90 minute train achievement. Once you have a locomotive or another train component built, you can place other components down next to it, and if the new component is close enough, it will automatically snap into place and connect to the previous component. Now there are many ways you can set your trains up, but there are a few common ones. If your trains will only ever go in one direction, you can get away with just a single locomotive, although adding extra will mean your train can accelerate faster. The locomotive doesn't have to be at the front of the train, but I, and most people, think it looks a little nicer if it is. The choice is up to you. If your train will need to run in both directions, you'll need some locomotives that face the other direction. You can rotate a locomotive with R as long as it's not connected to any other train components. If you look on various Factorio forums, you may see people referring to train structures as 1-4, or 383, etc. A 1-4 train is a train with one locomotive and four non-locomotives, usually cargo wagons. A 383 has three locomotives at the front, eight wagons, and three locomotives at the back facing the other way. Depending on what you're transporting, you'll need to decide exactly what train setup is best for your individual situation. Lastly, a quick aesthetic option. Going into the train menu, which will be covered in greater detail later in the video, there's an option up here to change the colour of the train. Click the colour dropper icon in the corner to open a small window with slider bars to set red, green and blue values. You can use the slider bars, or just enter the numbers manually. If you don't know how the red-green-blue colour scheme works, give it a quick Google. Alternatively, there are entire lists of colours and their RGB values that you can find on the internet. 
The colour doesn't have any mechanical influence on the game, but it can make it easier to see at a glance which train is which. So you might want to colour your plastic train white and your coal train black, for example. Each locomotive can have a different colour, even when they're in the same train. So you'll need to set the colour for each locomotive in the train individually. You can do this easier by simply copy-pasting the colour of a train from another train with shift right click and shift left click. But this will also copy any train scheduling settings. So be careful if you're copying the colour from a locomotive in one train to the locomotive in another. Before discussing anything else, we should discuss fuel. Fueling your trains is not necessarily a trivial topic, as you need to make sure that each and every one of your trains has enough fuel to get where it's going. In a complicated network, if a single train runs out of fuel at the wrong moment, it will just stop, which will block other trains and eventually shut down your entire factory. Trains can run on wood, coal, solid fuel, rocket fuel, or nuclear fuel. Wood and coal are your basic fuel items, and each are suitable to get things running, though trains can burn through wood extremely quickly, as it has half the fuel value of coal, so bear that in mind when designing your system. Solid fuel is a good step up. It has three times the fuel value of coal, so it will last a nice long time, and as an added bonus, it provides a 20% boost to the acceleration of the train, and a 5% boost to the top speed. So the train can run faster, and it can reach that top speed faster as well. Rocket fuel is one step better again. Its fuel value is ten times that of solid fuel, but it only stacks to one-fifth as much. Still, a fully fueled train should therefore last twice as long before needing refueling. Rocket fuel provides a 15% boost to top speed, and an 80% boost to acceleration, making things move even faster. Lastly, nuclear fuel. Nuclear fuel has 12.1 times the fuel value of rocket fuel, but it doesn't stack. Still, a train running on the stuff will last even longer. It provides the same 15% boost to top speed, and a massive 150% boost to vehicle acceleration, meaning that with nuclear fuel and fully upgraded braking force, your trains will spend most of their time travelling at very high speeds. Great for moving items around, but less great if you forget to look where you're going. Locomotives can only be automatically refuelled when they are stopped, most often at a train stop. I'll go through the mechanics of actually setting up an automatic refueler later, but you'll want to make sure that every train has at least one way of getting refuelled, or you'll end up with empty trains blocking your network whenever they run out. The cargo wagon is likely to be your main method of holding materials as you transport them around your base via rails. It costs 20 iron plate, 20 steel plate, and 10 iron gear wheels. They work like a mobile chest, with 40 stacks of available space. A cargo wagon can be limited, like a chest can, but it has the additional benefit of being able to filter individual slots to only be able to hold a specific item. This means you can have a single wagon easily hold a specific ratio of different items without having to worry about setting up some complicated circuit condition for the inserters filling or emptying it. The fluid wagon is to the cargo wagon, as the storage tank is to the chest. It costs 16 steel plate, 10 iron gear wheels, 1 storage tank, and 8 pipes to construct, and has a capacity of 25,000 fluid. Like a storage tank, it can only hold one kind of fluid at a given time, so if you're transporting several kinds of fluid on a single train, you will either need to barrel your fluids and place them into a cargo wagon, or use multiple fluid wagons. The artillery wagon is a late-game item that costs 40 steel plate, 10 iron gear wheels, 20 advanced circuits, 64 engine units, and 16 pipes. It functions almost identically to the artillery turret, except for two major differences. The first difference is that it can of course be moved, meaning you can defend a base with fewer wagons than you could turrets. The other main difference is that an artillery wagon can hold up to 100 artillery shells, compared to the turret's meagre 15. This means that one potential use of an artillery wagon is simply as a storage cart to ferry round shells to stationary artillery turrets. The last thing to note is that the artillery wagon can only fire when the train is stationary, 
so make sure you give it enough time to make a difference before moving the train to the next station. Locomotives have two operation modes, manual and automatic, the latter of which will be covered a little later. To drive a train manually, stand next to the train and enter it as you would a car or a tank. By default, this is the enter or the return button on your keyboard. Use the toggle switch to make sure the train is in manual mode. Each locomotive has such a switch, but changing the switch on any locomotive will also change the settings for the entire train. Make sure the train has at least one fueled locomotive, and move forward or backwards with the W and S keys. Your direction of travel will depend on the direction of the locomotive in which you are sitting. You can also get into any of the non-locomotive carriages, but this might give you an unexpected direction, so be careful when pulling off. Of course, you can only move the train along a track, but when you come to a split in the track that faces the right way, you can steer using the A and the D keys. You'll have to use the train's perspective, so if the train is moving southwards and you want to steer eastwards, you'll actually want to press A, not D. If you don't steer when coming into an intersection, the train will move straight ahead. If the junction has no rail that goes straight ahead, for example one going left and one going right, and you don't steer, the train will move to the right if moving forwards, and to the left if moving backwards. Trains can only drive in reverse while in manual mode, and they do so at a lower eff efficiency. If you want an automatic train to move both ways, you'll need one or more locomotives facing the other way attached somewhere along the train. Note that while in manual mode, you are perfectly able to drive through signals of any colour, so it's possible, or even likely, that you'll end up crashing into things. Use manual mode at your own risk. If you want to use trains in automatic mode, you'll need a way of telling them where to stop, and this is where the train stop item comes in. They cost 6 iron plates, 3 steel plates, 6 iron sticks, and 5 electronic circuits, and can only be placed down next to a track. If you hold a train stop in your hand, and move the cursor near some tracks, you'll be shown green squares where the stop may be placed. Note that you can only place the stop on straight sections of track that are aligned north-south or east-west, so no curves and no diagonals. Once the stop is placed, you can move your cursor over it to see where a train pulling up to that stop will actually be. Each white box signifies a train carriage or a locomotive. By default, you'll only see four white boxes, or as many boxes will take you back to the end of a track or the previous signal but this option can be changed to values between 1 and 12 in the settings menu under interface and train visualization length. Clicking on the train will open its menu. Firstly, you have a color selector as you do with a locomotive. You can set the color with RGB values or copy them from another train stop or even from a locomotive. Note that if you copy from another train stop, you will also copy train stop settings such as its name, so be careful there. You can also change the train stop's name, which is vital if you want your train network to make any sense. The default name can be changed by clicking the edit icon, at which point you'll be able to select the name of any other train stop on the map, or create a new name of your choice. Click the apply change button to make your choice. You'll be able to see the names of your stations on the map view along with their position if you enable the train stop names option. The angle of the text is configurable in settings. Lastly, you'll be able to see a list of trains which currently have this station in their schedule. Clicking on any of the trains in that list will take you to the settings page for that train. There are also two buttons in the top corner which will allow you to connect the train stop to a logistics network or a circuit network. The reasons for why you might want to do that will be covered later in the video. One more thing to note, when you place the stop down, Trains will only be able to see it if it is on the right-hand side of the track from the train's perspective, so it's important to make sure you keep track of which trains can get to which places and in which direction. The same is also true for signals, which we will come to now. Signals are how you can let your trains in automatic mode know where other trains are and avoid crashing into them. 
Starting off with the basics, we have two kinds of signals, a rail signal and a rail chain signal. They both cost 5 iron plates and an electronic circuit to make, and they are placed alongside rails in a similar fashion to train stops. For now, let's stick with basic rail signals. If I hold one in hand, you can see that this rail here gets a yellow line drawn on it. I'll move the cursor over, and you can see green boxes saying where I can place it. I'll place one down on the right hand side of the track, so a train moving south to north will see it. You can see that the coloured line is now split. This means that we have now created a second rail block. Another signal will create a third rail block. Each signal defines the end of one rail block and the beginning of the next. Now you can see that these two signals are both showing a green colour. This means that the rail block ahead of them is empty, so the rail signal is safe to cross. If I place a train here though, this first signal turns red. The rail block ahead of it is occupied, so that block is not safe for another train to enter. Any trains coming up will stop behind it and wait at the signal until it is safe to continue. Rail blocks also work at junctions and intersections. Here we have a cross, but while a train wouldn't be able to turn the corner here, all of the rails in the middle of the cross are part of the same block. So if a train enters from the south, the signal here also turns red, showing it is no longer safe for trains to cross from east to west. Rail signals also have a third colour, yellow. If a train is moving too fast to stop before it gets to the next block, then it needs to reserve that block to make sure that other trains won't enter the block before it gets there. But the signal it uses on its own path can't turn red, or it would be going through a red signal, so instead it sets the signal to yellow. Essentially, a yellow signal can be treated like a green signal for the train that's about to pass it, but a red signal for everything else. If you see a yellow signal while you're walking along a train track, look out, as it means a train is about to come past, and probably at speed. Chain signals have a bit of a bad reputation for complexity, but this isn't really true. They can be used to make more efficient rail junctions, but their actual function is quite simple. If a train is in the block ahead of a chain signal, it will be red like a normal signal, or yellow if that signal is about to be passed by a train. If the block ahead of the signal is clear, instead of just going green, it will look at the colour of the next signal, and be the same colour. So if the next signal is green, the chain signal is green. If the next signal is red, the chain signal is red. If there's a junction after the chain signal, and there's more than one signal to look ahead to, it will check all of them. If they are all green, then the chain signal is green. If they are all red, the chain signal is red. If there is at least one green and at least one red, we have a fourth colour, blue. A train will treat a blue signal as either green or red, depending which direction the train is intending to go. Now you may have noticed that I've only placed signals on one side of a track so far, but you may be in a position that you want to place signals on both sides of a track as you want to have trains travel in both directions along it. To do this, you need to have your signals exactly mirror each other, by placing signals on the white boxes that indicate the positions opposite existing signals. A lone signal on the wrong side of the track tells the train that that piece of track is one way and no entry, so you may have trains that don't know where to go. So when should you place signals? Now you could ask 10 different people this question, and get 20 different answers, but as a general rule of thumb, on straight, one-way sections of track, you should have a signal about every train length to increase the number of trains you can have using that stretch of track. Note that this does not apply to two-way sections of track, as you don't want to end up with two trains stuck on the same section of track facing each other. When it comes to junctions and intersections, a good rule of thumb is chain signals on the way in and through the intersection, and normal signals on the way out. You will also want to make sure that there is at least one train length of space between the last signal in the junction and the next signal. 
So for this crossing intersection here, we can replace these signals with chain signals. And that will mean no train can enter the cross unless there is space enough for them to leave it, which should prevent trains from queuing through the intersection. There will be examples later where I work through building various intersections, and you'll see this rule in practice there. So, you've set up a mining outpost, built the rails to connect it back to your main base, placed stops at either end, and built a train to carry the ore back to base. Now let's hop into the menu of a train and see how we can set up an automatic schedule. You can click on any locomotive in the train to open the menu, and while we're setting up the schedule, you might want to make sure the train is set to manual mode, just to make sure it's not going to run away from you before you've finished setting everything up. On the left hand side of the window here, you'll see a button that says Add Station. Click on that, and you'll be shown a list of stations on the map. Depending where your stations are, and in what state they're in, you may see them in white, blue, or red. A white station means that your train will be able to find its way to that station if you select it. A red one means that there is no valid path for this train to get to that station. A blue name means that you have at least one station with that name that the train can find its way to, but also at least one that it can't, because it is possible to have more than one station with the same name. More on that later. Click the desired station name to add it to the train schedule. You'll now see the station in the list. You can add other stations along the train's route in the same way, and remove any unwanted stations by clicking the cross. Now your train knows where to go, but it doesn't know how long to stay at the station before moving on. If you set the train off now, it will visit each station in the list in order, but it won't actually stop at any of them, so it will just go around in circles. Leaving a station in your list without a so-called wait condition can be useful if you want a train to go via a specific route, but it isn't really useful in a simple scenario. Clicking the Add Wait Condition button under a station gives us this pop-up menu, with different conditions that we can use. Time Passed will give us a counter we can set, and means the train will go to the station, stop, wait for the specified time, and then continue to the next stop on its schedule. Again, there's a cross that we can use to remove a condition we no longer want. We can click the Add Wait Condition button again to add another wait condition. Inactivity gives us another time counter, again one that we can set, and means that a train will stop at the station and wait there until nothing has happened for the specified length of time. For example, you may want to select this option to send your train home if no extra materials have been added to the train's cargo wagons for the last 10 seconds. Now that we have two wait conditions, we have another option here that currently says OR. As it is, the train will wait until either two minutes have passed, or nothing has happened for 10 seconds. If we click the OR button, it changes to AND. Now the train will remain at the station until two minutes have passed, and nothing has happened for ten seconds. You can also click on the striped bar to change the order of conditions, as you can with entire stations on the schedule. This will change the configuration of AND and OR if you have more than one of them, so be careful there. Continuing through the other wait conditions, we have full inventory, which means the train will wait at the station until its inventory is full. That is to say, there is no more space in either its cargo wagons, fluid wagons, or artillery wagons. Next, we have empty inventory, which, as you might imagine, means the train will wait at the station until the inventory of all of its carriages has been emptied. Next is item count. This allows us to select a condition that evaluates over the contents of the train's inventory, and will make the train wait at the station until that condition is met. For example, we can tell the train to wait until there are more than 100 yellow belts in the train, or less than a thousand concrete. Next is fluid count. This works in a similar way to item count, but is used if your train has fluid wagons. For example, you can tell your train to wait at an oil outpost until it has more than 20,000 crude oil on board. Next is circuit condition. If you connect a train stop to the circuit network, and set the stop to pass the value of the network to the train, 
you can use that network to set a condition which will let the train leave the station. For example, a technique I've used in the past is to measure all of the available ore at an outpost, and when that number drops to zero, send a signal to the train just to make sure it delivers the last batch of ore to the smelting area. You can click the card to see my circuit network tutorial and learn more about how you can set up such conditions. Lastly, we have two more conditions, passenger present and passenger not present. The first of these will allow the train to proceed if you or another player is sitting in the train, and the latter will only allow the train to proceed if no one is sitting in the train. These can be useful to set if you have a dedicated passenger train in your base, or if you don't want a train to run off somewhere else before you've gotten on. So now you have your train set up, perhaps to wait at an outpost until it's full, and then go back to the base and wait there until it's been emptied. Now all we need to do is actually fill and empty it. For cargo wagons and artillery wagons, we want to use inserters. In the example here, we can run a belt from the mining drills to where the train pulls up at the stop, and place an inserter to feed ore from the belt into the cargo wagon. We can speed this up significantly, as each wagon has space for six inserters along each side. With a setup like this, we can greatly decrease the amount of time it will take to fill the train. For an unloading station, we can simply reverse the direction of the inserters, pulling items out of the wagon and placing it onto a belt. You can use various techniques to make sure that one or both sides of the belt get filled, but that would be a topic for another video, so what we have here will do for now. If you want to use something more advanced, there's many places you can look at, but I would recommend at least trying to solve it yourself first. After all, solving such a puzzle is half the fun of the game. One thing to consider, however, is balancing between wagons. Here we have two wagons on our train, but as you can see, the first wagon is taking all the ore from the belt, and the second is getting none. This won't have much effect in the long run if your train has a full inventory condition, but it will do if you use a time past wait condition, or if you need your train to get back and forth faster. So it's a good idea to use various combinations of splitters to make sure that each wagon gets an approximately even distribution of items. Now, if you've seen various train station setups before elsewhere, or if you've played the game and you've been screaming at what I have on the screen here, don't worry, I'm getting into it now. It is almost universally considered a good idea to use a buffering system when loading or unloading trains. With the setup we have so far, it's all very well and good while the train is here unloading, but once it's full and it's gone on its way, the belts will quickly back up and the whole outpost will just shut down until the train returns. Similarly, back at the base, the train will remain at an unloading station until the base has used up all of its materials before heading back to the outpost, leaving the base to starve while the train is away refilling. We can mitigate this effect by introducing a layer of chests between the belt and the cargo wagon. Now, while the train is here, the inserters will move items from the chest to the wagon as quickly as they can, based on your current stack size, so it might be a good idea to use stack inserters here. This will fill the train nice and quickly. While the train is away, delivering its resources to the base, the mining outpost can continue to work and will quietly refill the chests for when they are next needed. Meanwhile, at the base, the train arrives laden with ore, unloads it quickly into the chests before going off to get more. The chests can slowly deplete, allowing the furnaces to continue working until the train gets back. Fluid wagons work a little differently, but the principle is the same. Instead of using inserters, we want to use pumps. Each fluid wagon has three spots to which a pump can connect, and will pump fluid to or from a connected fluid container, whether that be a pipe, a storage tank, or a chemical plant, etc. It's worth implementing a buffer system here as well. Also worth taking note of is that a pump has a much higher throughput than a pipe, so instead of pumping to a pipe, I would recommend pumping directly from the fluid wagon to a storage tank for maximum unloading or loading speed. Before moving on to examples, let's have a quick discussion about rail layouts. 
Most commonly, you'll see a system like this, with two sets of tracks, one for trains going in each direction. Your system might be right-hand drive or left-hand drive, and there are slight pros and cons to each, but what matters most is to pick one, stick with it, and don't change it on any given map, or you'll most likely just end up confusing yourself. Having separate rails for each direction means that your tracks can have many more trains on them without gridlocking, and it's much easier to see which trains are going where. In addition, while I wouldn't describe it as a trivial task, it is possible to upgrade a system like this to a system where you have two rails going in each direction, or three or more if you have a really big base. Another system that's commonly used, especially for extremely long distance rails, is a single line of two-way traffic. The main advantage of this system is that it will require far fewer rails to build and is therefore much cheaper. However, for each train past the first that you want to have running on it at any given time, you will need to have a passing place where trains can pass each other. This is essentially a short section of one-way traffic on two lines as before. These will need to be at least as long as your trains, and they can slow traffic down significantly, so I would definitely not recommend using a system like this in areas of high throughput. So now we'll move on to the example portion of the tutorial. As this is a little easier to explain while it's being done, I will now cut to real-time betrayal to take it from here. Okay, so I have loaded up a new world. Uh, I'm using the creative mode mod so I don't have to worry about doing the researches or building the actual materials. I've just got them... I've just got free access to them. The first example we're going to do is some simple uh, cross intersections. Strictly speaking, these aren't junctions uh, because the trains can't turn, um, but we're just going to work through the signaling here. So, uh, trains are going to come in on that way and that way, I've decided. Okay, so they're just there as markers so I know which way the trains are going. Okay, now. If you remember from earlier, as we come to the intersection, we want a chain signal on the way in and a normal signal on the way out. Similarly, coming up from the south here, we want a chain signal on the way in and a normal signal on the way out. And then that will now work. Um, I also mentioned earlier, but didn't properly explain, that between this outward signal here and the next signal, however far that is, we need to have at least one train length there. Uh, let me see if I can show you why that is the case. Uh, so I'll just make this train a bit longer. Okay. Now, uh, let's say for whatever reason that signal is red. Now at the moment we can still cross this. Um, this signal here is green because this block here, the one with this yellow line, is empty. So that signal is green, therefore the chain signal is green. So this train will quite happily go through the intersection and stop at that red signal. And then if that one has run out of fuel, as it has done, um, that's just going to stop there. Um, or if for whatever reason this train is delayed by something, um, we've completely blocked off the intersection here. So this train, which doesn't have any fuel, um, will, whoops, will just stop at this red signal here and not be able to go any further. Uh, however, if the train is shorter than the gap between these two signals, then while no trains can enter the intersection, because this one is red, because this one is red, or the other way around, uh, trains are still happily able to go through the intersection that way. Okay, now let's expand this a bit more. Um, I'll put that back over there. Okay, now let's say we have another rail coming in from this way. Okay, put some fuel in that so it stops flashing at me. Okay, so now this train coming in from 
Actually, I'll come back to that one. So this train coming in from the east, that's fine. The train coming in from the west, we want to do exactly the same. A, raise, a, ra a chain signal in and a normal rail signal out. And then this one coming up from the south, we've already got the chain signal in. We want a normal rail signal on the way out. And then this one in the middle, we just need to swap that out for a chain signal. Easy as that. We can extend this further. So if we've got two crossing two, then this one is coming down from the north. So we just need a chain signal there, chain signal there. Uh, no, that should be a normal rail signal. And then this one coming in from the east, we want a chain signal there. It's already got the chain and normal signals there. And then coming in from the west, we've got a chain signal. That one needs to be swapped for a chain signal. And then a normal signal on the way out. So this is just a very basic uh, example of chain signals on the way into and through the junction. And normal signals on the way out of the junction. And then at least one train length of gap before the next signal. Okay. After that you could oh, you could have signals wherever you like really. But this one here is important, otherwise you might end up blocking your intersection. Okay, now let's do some simple actual junctions. So we'll start off with a simple cross like this, with trains coming in from the east and the south, as before. Except this time, we'll give trains a way to turn onto the other line. Okay, uh, a bit further along. Okay, so they're the only lines we need, because this train can't turn south, otherwise it'd be going against the flow of traffic. Similarly, this one can't turn right. Now, where do we want signals here? So, um, remember... The rule is chain signals in the way into and through the junction, normal signals on the way out. And within the junction, where do we need those signals? So it can be optimized, but again, general rule of thumb, and signals are cheap anyway, um, whenever you have lines splitting or meeting or crossing, you want to have a signal just before it. Okay, so let's start with this train. Let's follow its path turning right. So we've got a split here. So we want a signal. We've got a join here. Um, so we want a signal just before it, which is there. That's the closest we can get just before it. And then we have a join here. So we want a signal there. And that's the last one in the junction, so that can be a normal signal. Then we'll follow through. So straight through. We've already got a chain signal there. We've got these two red lines crossing there, so we want a chain signal just before that. And we've got two lines meeting here, so we want a chain signal there. And then on the way out of the junction, we want our normal signal. Okay. Then for the south train, coming up, we've got a We've got lines splitting, we've got the cross, we've got lines joining, and then we've already got our signal on the way out. And then turning left, we've already got our signal there, we've got the lines joining there, so we want a signal just before it, and then we've already got the one on the way out. And then that is adequately signalled. Uh, a couple of these are strictly speaking not necessary, like I could get rid of those two without any major problems. Um, but just as a, I'll, I'll stick with the sort of overdoing it on the signals just so I can follow that rule of whenever those lines meet, split, or cross, that's when we want to signal. Okay, next we'll do a slightly different one. Um, so this one will have two running that way. And I'm going to have a single line running down, and we're going to join these two, except this one is two-way traffic. Um, so the places that I've used this kind of system in the past is where 
I've had a station like that that might have a double-headed train, something like that. So my normal system is the usual two lanes of one-way traffic, just like a two-way street, and then the train will pull into the station, unload or load, and then it will pull out the way it came and join back to the network. Okay, now you do have to be a bit careful about rail placement here, because if you just pack the rails in as tightly as they go, you don't have enough space for the signals to fit where you need them. So, uh, let's... I think... That should be fine. It might even have a bit too much space there. Well, not too much space, but more space than we need. So essentially, so this line here needs to be attached to both ways on this bottom line here that drives from uh, east to west, because it can pull in from the east or pull out to the west. And this triangle here is what limits the, the size. So I could make this a bit smaller and still fit signals in there, um, but not that much smaller. Okay, then we also need lines coming in that way because it can pull in from the west and similarly it can pull out to the east. Okay, so there's all the rails. So how do we signal this? Right, let's start with a train coming from the east and we'll just go straight ahead. So there's a split in the lines there, so we'll have a signal. There's a join in the lines there, so we'll have a signal. And then we'll have a ch uh, normal signal on the way out. Then let's do trains coming in from the west. Okay, so chain signals. Um, there's a split in the line, so we'll have a signal. There's a cross, so we'll have a signal there. There's another cross, so we'll have a signal there. There's a join, so we'll have a signal. And then a normal rail signal to cap it off. Okay, then let's do trains from the east coming into the station. Okay, so we've got a chain signal. There's a cross, so we need a signal before that. There's a join, so we need a signal before that. Now, we could space this out because there's actually two joins here. Um, but because of the way I've got this system, um, in fact, because of the way the system works all together, there can only be one train here anyway. So no matter which of these four lines it wants to take, um, we don't want a second train coming in this far. So in this case, it's okay. Um, but we do want a signal there, just to cap it all off. So this chain signal here is actually catering for both this join of that line and that line, and this three-way join here of this line, this line, and that line. Okay, then we'll do the train coming from the west going into the station. So we've already got the signal before that split. And then this join up here wants a signal there. And it's already got the output signal. Okay, now if the train in the station wants to leave and go west, it wants to come down this way. So... Remember, the signal on this line here needs to be directly opposite that one, otherwise it won't work. Um, and in fact, that's the only place it will let us put it at the moment. So we'll put that there. Then it comes down, so that signal takes care of, again, both of these splits, the 1 to 3 split and then the 1 to 2 split. Coming down here, there's a cross, so we'll put a signal there. There's a join, so we'll put a signal there and it's already got the output signal. Then we want this train coming from the north going eastwards, so we've got a signal there, that caters for the split, and then the join, we want a signal there, and then it's already got the output signal. So that is now correctly signalled. Um, you can see that, so this signal here is blue, that means there is at least one way it can't go, which turns out to be into the station, which is good because the station is occupied at the moment, and at least one way it can go, because there's nothing stopping it from going straight ahead. This one is exactly the same. 
Uh, this train up here can... So this is the signal it's actually looking at because it looks to its right, which is our left because it's coming down. That one is just green because it, there's nothing stopping it going down this way and joining the network, and there's nothing stopping it from coming down this way and joining the network. If I just put a train randomly in the middle there, then this signal turns red. So yeah, that is a two-way to a bidirectional line. Okay, the next one we want to do is a two-way to a two-way. We're just going to do this as a T-junction. There are ways you can do this as a like a Y-junction as well. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise for the viewer. But again, the principles are the same. So again, we need to be careful about um, putting the rails too close together on this one. Otherwise, we won't have space for the signals. Now, I'm doing a left-hand drive. So we've got trains coming in that way and trains coming up that way and down that way. So this line can turn to join this way or it can go a bit further and turn to join that way. So let's just put some rails down and see what kind of space we've got. Um, so there and oops that's the wrong way. There. Okay, and that will join with the correct direction. This one is essentially the same, but mirrored. Let's get me some more rails. So that one can either come from that way, or up there. Now, that one's a little bit off-center, and it does go to show that this time, it's this triangle here that limits us for size. And you can see, yeah, I can't fit any signals in the middle there. So let's change that. I think it was wrong anyway, because um, it, it didn't look as symmetrical as it should have. So I think if we go up there, how much space do we have in that triangle now? Okay, there is enough for a couple of signals in there. You can see the two green boxes. And I think we... M I think that's enough for us to get away with, because, uh, let's see, yeah, in fact, I don't think we actually need to use those signals, because I, th you, you would, I think, I'll, I'll probably, I'll come back to this and I'll probably prove myself wrong, um, but in a left-hand drive system, you don't need that central triangle. In a right-hand system, you would. Anyway, let's signal it and see where it goes wrong. <laughs> okay, so we'll just go through all of the possible inputs and outputs and line them with signals. So we'll start with this train here going straight ahead. So we've got a split, a cross, a cross, a join, and then the output. And this one can also turn. So we've got the split, which is covered, a join, and then the output, and that's that train done. Let's do this train. So we've got coming along this way a split, a join, and then an output, and then turning. We've got the split, which is covered. We've got a cross, a cross, a ah, okay. So theoretically, we want a signal on here. Otherwise, trains on this line and trains on this line can block each other. Um, let me give you an example. So let's say there's a train coming down here and turning this way. At the same time, there's a train coming up here, that way around, turning that way. Now, they don't ever get in each other's way, so they should be able to go through this junction at full speed, assuming that there's nothing over here. However, because I can't put a signal between these two, that means 
this bit here is sharing a block with this bit here, which means that this whole system is no good. So let's try it again and spread things out a bit further. Yeah, okay, so it's a little bit wonky, and with enough time you could work it out that you'd make a nice symmetric junction. But it's the principles that we're going through here. So we've got a split, a cross, a cross, a join, and the way out. And then turning, we've got the split, and a join, and the way out. This one going straight ahead has a split, and a join, and the way out. And then turning, it's got the split, a join, a join. No, it has a split, a cross, a cross, and a join. Now I can put that signal there. And the way out. And then these trains, um, or this train, that's the only one coming in. Uh, we've got a split there. We've got a cross, a cross, and a join, and the way out. And then the split, a join, and the way out. So that is now properly signalled. Um, so looking at the trains and where they can go, this one coming up is green because there's nothing stopping it from going east or west. This one can only go straight ahead, um, so it's blue. If you try to turn left, this train is in the way because it's occupying this block. Similarly, this one can only go straight ahead um, because this train is occupying the block. Um, so yeah, see if you can come up with a better system, um, or I guess you could look online, people put blueprint books of such systems online that you can just copy and paste into your world. Okay, now let's do a bit of a beast. Um, a two-way cross-junction. So we've got this kind of setup that we did before, but this time we also want trains to be able to turn. Um, now again, there are many places you can find that will do nice symmetric ones for you. There's a, a couple I particularly like, like a, there's a windmill style one, which I like the look of. But anyway, we've got our trains, so we know where they're coming in. I'm, again, I'm doing left-hand drive. Um, now, so this train wants to be able to turn left onto this line, but it also wants to be able to turn right onto that line. So I'm going to spread this out probably much more than I need to, but it is better to have too much space than too little. Okay, so that can turn that way and that way. This train coming up wants to be able to turn left onto that way or right onto that way. So um, let's say you can turn left there. Also want to be able to turn right. And I'm not liking the look of that because we've got a triangle up there. Yeah, so that's not going to work because this train coming from the right wants to have a signal in there. So I think what I'll actually do, I will find a system that works or I'll design a system that works, ugly as it might be. Um, and then I will come back and show you the signaling for it. Okay, I think this works. And it's even quite symmetrical. Um, it does have a couple of places where you've got three lines like crossing like that. Um, but I believe that that's okay in this case. Uh, essentially, whether or not you can have like lots of stuff together like this is... If you take two lines that are parallel, so this line and this line, and follow them through the junction, so they can go straight like that, or they can both turn like that, or they can both turn this way, 
Um, or, in fact, uh, they can diverge as well. If they diverge, that's okay. Essentially, two lines that never cross should never be part of the same block. So every line that joins them, such as this one here and this one there, you need to be able to fit a signal along that joining line to be able to separate them. So turning that way, I can fit signals along this bit of track and that bit of track. Turning this way, I can fit signals along that bit of track, this bit of track, that bit of track, and that bit of track. And going straight ahead, I can fit signals along there, along there, along there, along there, along there, and along there. Um, hopefully, you can follow that. Um, if I'm feeling brave, I might edit it a bit to show some graphics or animation, but show what I mean a little bit clearer. Anyway, um, once you've got a system that allows you to turn, let's signal it. So we'll start with this train. Coming in, uh, we'll start by turning left. So we've got a split there, so a signal before that. We've got a join there, so a signal before that. And the way out. Then going straight ahead, we've got the split which is covered. There's a cross, well there's actually a split and then a cross but they're both covered by that signal. We've then got a cross, uh, two crosses in a row there, and then a join over here, and then a join over there, and then the way out. Okay, then we'll turn right. So we've got a split, a split and a cross. Then over here, we've got two crosses in a row, then up there we've got uh, a cross and then a join. We'll put the signal there, and then a join, and then the way out. And then that's this train done. So let's go clockwise. So coming up, uh, we've got a split, a split, a join, and then we've already done the rest of those signals, going straight ahead, split, split, Crosses, cross, uh, cross and a join, and then we've done the rest. Turning right, we've got that one which we've done. We've got a cross on that line. There we go. Crosses, and then a join, and then the way out. And then that's that train done. This train, we've got the way in. Turning left, we want one up there. Going straight ahead, we want them there, 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 and there. Oh, actually, we've got two along here. So we want one there for this join, and there for that join. Yes, you can see if you sort of take the rotational symmetry of it, we've got two along there, we've also got two along there. Okay, and then turning right, we've got one there, one there, one before that heap of crosses, one before this cross, and one in there before that join. And then it's just the train at the top to do. So we've got the way in, turning this way. We've got one before that uh, split there, one before this join here, and then we've done the rest, going straight ahead. One before all of these crosses, one before this cross, one before this cross, and then we've got the rest. And then turning off this way, we've got one before those crosses, one before those crosses, one before this join, and we are signaled. And you can see at the moment that actually everything is green, because these four trains are all on separate lines at the moment. Um, so there's actually no way that one of these trains moving forward could crash into another train. If I put a train over there, we'll see some things change colour, so we'll test it. This one still has all three of its outputs available. This one ha can still turn to its left or go straight ahead, but it can't go along here. So we've got red signal, red signal, red, red. 
This one can turn to the right or to the left. So blue is fine, green is fine. Turning to the right, it goes blue and then blue again, and then greens all the rest of the way. Or it goes blue, blue, and then reds. So it can't go through the junction if it's trying to go straight ahead. Okay, so that is how you can do a two-way crossing intersection. There is another way, which is somewhat divisive. Um, but it is a it's a simple way. It is um, much less complicated than this one. However, it does have its own downfalls. So now let's move on to the roundabout. If you have shorter trains, and ideally not that many of them, you can do intersections in a more simple way both crosses and T-junctions as well. In fact, you can even just do a straight-up corner with this, um, and that is by doing a roundabout. Um, it has the advantage of looking quite nice, I think, um, and being very simple to make. Uh, it allows your trains to turn around if they need to. The downsides are that uh, it can cause... Um, backups and it will slow down your network particularly if you have a lot of trains and especially if you have long trains so the way to do it um, first obviously you need to know where your roundabout is going to go uh, it can take a little bit of work to get it in the right place I think here is where I want it whoops that's not right so essentially you just want a circle like that and you want the circle to be lined up where so these two curved rails the join between them is directly in the middle of these two straight rails and similarly coming up as well then um, you just want to join things up onto it so those ones come in like that these ones come down like that and that. Oops, that's wrong. There we go. There and there, and we'll. Oh, nope. And this one comes up to there and up to there. Okay. Now, signaling this one is. Well, the reasoning behind it is exactly the same, but it's a little bit more difficult to follow. Um, that said, it's very easy to remember how to signal this, because we want chain signals on the way in, and on the way through. So we also want chain signals there, 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 and there on the diagonals, and also there, 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 and there and then normal signals on the way out. So again, that is properly signaled now. Um, and if you follow it through, it is exactly the same. So let's say we want to follow this train turning to the right. So it'll come in this way, it'll turn around, and it'll go up there. So we've got a join. So we want a signal before the join. We've got a split. So we want a signal before the split. We've got a join, so a signal before the join, a split, so a signal before the split, a join and its signal, a split and its signal, and then the way out. So it's exactly the same reasoning. Um, but yes, you can see because of its rotational symmetry, it is just much easier. Uh, another advantage to this is if I... Let's just come over here for a bit, and I'll pop down... A roundabout just on its own and I will I will signal it exactly the same I think is that right no there um, yeah you can see here that it is, it is exactly rotationally symmetric um, which means 
if I do this with uh, a normal signal there and a chain signal there, I can have this as a blueprint. So I'll just put it in the on the clipboard for now. And then let's say I have an end of my rail that I just want to tidy up a bit. I can put that just on the end of it. And um, it's a bit too many signals there for what it's being used for at the moment. But if there are only trains facing the wrong way, they're more than happy just to come up here and use this as a loop to turn around. And then let's say later on, I want to extend like this. Now I could just get rid of it and extend it, or I can bring back exactly the same blueprint and just copy and paste directly on top of it. I can then turn that into a T-junction or a cross-junction. So I have seen and I have built as well systems uh, where the entire world is basically based on a grid of systems like of rail intersections like this. Um, so whether or not you want to do this, it's up to you. Um, generally speaking, people argue against it, but if you're a beginner to rails, it's a good way of getting your feet wet with more complicated rail systems, I think. Moving on to some more advanced examples, let's have a look at what is called a train stacker. So, here's our example. We have a completely broken train line. Let's try that again. There we go. So, over here, let's say we've got... This is an unloading station. So, we've got things coming out. Uh, let's just stop that flashing. There we go. Um, and trains will pull into here and they'll unload and then I'll go off to an outpost to grab some more. But we've got a lot of trains. Let's say we've, we could have 10 trains, all delivering iron ore to our base. Now, I suppose the naive way of doing this would be to have 10 trains going to 10 different outposts, coming back and delivering to 10 different train stations at the base. But you could simplify that a bit by instead of having 10 stations at the base, just have one station at the base with all 10 trains going to it. Now, this has problems. For example, um, let's say... Okay, if this is our main system up here, so we've got our two lines going in each direction, whoops, there we go, and I could just have the same sort of pull in, pull out kind of um, train station that we covered before, but for simplicity's sake, let's say that this loops round and joins the network again. Now, if I've got, um, so at the moment I've, I've just set up two unloaders there, so we can have a train there, and a signal, oops, and then a train with two more, and a signal, and I think if we have another one it will start sort of overlapping into the junction. So that means with a setup like this we can only have two trains delivering to the station before we might end up with a situation where all the trains arrive back in the base at once, and they get in the way of everything else. In fact, it could even be worse than that, because let's say this train comes from up there, and that one wants to go up that way. That's very bad. Um, but we could have trains queuing up there and there and there and so on, and we might end up with a situation where this train actually can't get out because everything's blocked up. Now, it shouldn't be the case if you've signalled everything correctly, but anyway, that's the problems with it. Um, the first way we can mitigate that kind of problem is with a train stacker. So, what that is, is something along... Uh, let's do it over here. These lines. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm using probably way more space than I need to here. Um, as you build this in your own world, you'll know exactly how much space you've got, and you'll know how many trains you've got as well. So, this is our main line. Okay, we'll have a simple junction here to the trains will come off and come down. And this is quite long. Uh, so at the moment I could probably fit uh, a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth train on that. So I could probably, just with this, serve the six trains from one station. However, we can greatly increase that. If I grab some more rails first up, if I split off the line there, come up, and then join back up again. And then do exactly the same. And then the same and the same and so on. So I'll just... Uh... I don't think I can fit another one on there before it gets confused with the curves. Just finish off that and get rid of this spare. There we go. Okay, so you may have seen something like this before. This is a train stacker. So what we do is if we put a line of signals along like that, so they're all coming down, and then I think, is it this? I think it's this one that wants to be a chain signal. No, that's wrong. Never mind. Ignore, ignore me. <laughs> okay, uh, it's up here that we want chain signals. So if I have a chain signal there, and then... Up here, we'll have another row of signals. So now, a train that wants to go to this station, it'll come in up here. Okay, at the moment, we've got a green signal. Okay, so it'll continue. It'll take one of these paths, difficult to say which one, but it'll come down one of them, green signal, green signal, and it'll end up waiting there. Okay, now these ones are red. But up here we've still got greens. So the next train that comes in, we've got a green signal. It'll take one of these paths. Let's just say it takes this one on the end. Green. It'll go in, but it will wait there. The next one will come in. This one's blue, which means that there's at least one path it can't go to. But there's still many others it can, and the way train pathing works, it will um, get as close to the station as it can. So let's say it comes down this line here, and that will wait up there. And the next one will come in and wait up there, and then there, and then there, and then there, and then there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and then finally, if we have another train, that one will wait up there. Now this is just a short station, so these trains are that long, which means I could probably squeeze in another row of signals there, and double the amount of trains we can have. So, uh, how many trains is that? That's 23, t and then this one down here, that is 24, and then that one down there, that is 25 trains now serviced by one station. Uh, although we probably don't want that one because it would interfere with the junction. But still, that is a lot of trains. And then when this train moves on, this train can move forwards, and then all of these turn green, but only one of them will actually have the chance to move forward, and as soon as it moves forwards, all of the rest of them turn red. So that one will then queue up there, and this one will move down to there, and then if that train goes off to the outpost and comes back before anything else is done, it will end up queuing in there. So yeah, that is a train stacker. Um, the concept is pretty simple, really. Um, 
one important thing that when I first made a train stacker I missed is that this here needs to be a chain signal. If it is a normal signal, then if another train comes in, you could end up with it queuing, say, there. Because it will just choose one of these, probably even at random, just to go down. Then if these trains move on, we've got space in our stacker for new trains, but this train can't go there because it's already turned, and any trains behind it are blocked by this train. So this train, uh, sorry, this signal there on the way into the stacker must be a chain signal. There is another uh, way that you can increase throughput to your base as well. This is more about increasing the number of trains you can have serviced per station. You can also increase the number of stations you can have per resource. Okay, so this concept is very similar to a stacker, um, and it can be incorporated with the stacker as well. But you can see here that we've got two train stations. Now at the moment, they've got different names, but what I could do is give them both the same name. So let's say this is an iron unloading station. Uh, if I just copy the settings from that station to the other with uh, shift right click and shift left click, these are now both called iron unloading. And if we have a number of trains, so at the moment I've got three trains here, let's say they all want to go to iron unloading. Okay, so copy, paste, paste, paste. So now they all go to iron unloading. And we, we send them off to do their jobs, which in this case is probably going to an iron outpost and then picking it up. So if I turn this one to automatic, these signals are on the wrong side of the tracks. There we go. It will stop there. So we've got a similar kind of signaling setup where we have a chain signal before the split and then normal signals just to say whether the station or not is available. Now, if I say this train unloads and then goes off on its way and well, I'll actually need some signals over here just quickly for reasons okay goes off on its way that train might take a moment yes but then it will repath and it will go to the available station if I have another train over here let me just fuel that and copy the settings so that one also wants to go to iron unloading then if this train then goes away, uh, it helps if I turn it to automatic, it will come into there. So I can have multiple trains just set to go to iron unloading and it will go to a station that is available. If they're all available, let's see what happens. Please go to iron unloading automatic. I'm not standing on the tracks. Yep, it will it will just go to the closest one uh, due to how trains work out their paths. It will go to the closest available station with the name that it wants. Um, and another good thing about this system is it is kind of, I don't know if modular is the right word, but it is certainly expandable. Uh, so if I copy that, I can, oops, I copied a bit too much. If I copy that and paste, too close to, ah, uh, these signals are in slightly different positions. There we go. Got there in the end. Copy that. Paste. And now I've got myself another station which is also called iron unloading. And I can just keep doing that. So if I need more and more iron coming into my base, I get more and more trains. But if they're still only being serviced by a single station, it's not going to increase the input of iron to my base. So if I get more stations, then I can do this. So yeah, it's, it's a relatively simple way, and if I've got lots of trains, I would probably have a, 
a stacker down here somewhere. So as stations become available, a train will come out of the stacker and go into the system over here. I am fully aware that I have left a lot out of this video, but this was designed just to be an introduction to the basics, to get you moving into the wonderful world of Factorio's trains. Explore, experiment and create, and if you have any questions, leave a comment below and I will do my best to answer them. In the meantime, I will say thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again soon.